today I wanted to talk about, uh, like I said, so I was like, man, what, what could I do today? You know, uh, I want this whole week to be, you know, Eve related because starting Friday, I'm going to be streaming, uh, a lot of Final Fantasy ne this weekend. So, um, at least I hope so. If the servers let me on. Anyway, um, so I, I know I wanted to make sure to like get some real time doing uh, Eve stuff this week, uh, but you know we talked about the Jove yesterday, um, and I was thinking about doing missions or the Abyss, and it's one of those things. It's like it was one of those days I couldn't choose what uh, what to do, so um, I was talking with Seeds once again, as as I often am doing in the morning. It seems now. Uh, and I can't remember how the conversation actually began. We said, oh, we were talking about like the races and their prehistory, like Kaldari Prime and how it was settled by a mega corporation. And Galente Prime comes from uh, a bunch of Frenchmen from Tau Ceti. And that, how that uh, influences their demographics and how those, uh, you know, empires evolved. And, uh, that led me into mentioning that uh, because the question was, why would the Kaldari, why would the mega corporation that purchased Kaldari Prime purchase Kaldari Prime? Why terraform a, shi a, a, a planet if you have perfectly good planet to just occupy, right? And it's a fairly interesting question. Um... So, I, I began to postulate first, uh, we don't, I, or I didn't know off the top of my head uh, which one was settled first, Galente Prime or Caldari Prime, um, but also uh, that led me into the fact that, as we heard yesterday in the Jovian story, one of the things that they kind of mention in passing was that there were these great empires in the early days that um, really controlled New Eden and particularly the use of gate travel. Um, and so I think that that... And we also see things like uh, the Isogen 5 caches, uh, which are attributed to Terrans, and other uses of the word Terran. But ultimately, we know that of the three, you know, there's, there's three uh, ancient races, right? The Talakan, the, because they, um, the Amar one ended up just being Blood Raiders, like uh, a, a separate Amar society. So that's not, that's not the same. They don't predate all the way back to the beginning, probably. I don't know. I might want to verify that. But... Either way, um, the second is uh, the, the Talakan, the Yanyong, and the Sleepers. Now, we know that the Sleepers are actually uh, offshoots of Second, jo uh, Second Empire Jove, specifically the Static Factions, and even more specific, the Stasis Faction within the Statics. Um, we also know that the uh, Talakun were the creators of the Dyson Swarm that surrounded W477 TACP and therefore are likely the, the constructors of Anoikis, the uh, artificially constructed network of systems um, bound together by the Talakin's technology. Harnessing the very power of an entire star to manipulate um, space-time. And that got me thinking, that got me, that, that broke the dam. So I've been building up this, this grand unified theory of like, what's going on? Oh, no, no, you, you just got here because we just got started, Matthew. Um, and so rather than present a bunch of evidence today, right away, 
what I'd really like to do is just kind of walk through the narrative as I understand it right now. So, uh, this information, the information that informs this theory is everything from concrete to speculative or, uh, you know, to, to, uh, uh, I guess, interpreted to f degrees of speculation. I'm not going to try to separate it today as, as so much, at least in my initial presentation. I just want to kind of talk about it as a story because I really feel like I may have figured out at least a cohesive story of the New Eden cluster from the New Eden uh, from the beginning to the the Second Jovian Empire, the the Shrouded Days, and through and the end of the Shrouded Days. So buckle up. So in the beginning, there were two empires. There were the Yanyong, and there was the Talakan. The Yanyong were masters of gravitonic energy. Uh, they were able to manipulate space-time uh, through the use, likely through the use of stars. Um, but we're not 100% sure. But we do know that they're masters of gravitonic energy. Um, and we also know that the... There were, so there, the other point was that there are these caches. Actually, let me just tell the story. Uh, so the Talakan and the Yanyong. The Yanyong lived in Galente space. The Talakan lived largely in kind of Mimitarish space, right? And ultimately, they went to war. Uh, we're not sure why. I'm sure it's just because people are dicks to each other. Um, this catalyzed the Talakan to um, develop... So the Yanyong developed technology to use Isogen 5 to create point defects for teleportation of, of ships and, and equipment and people, right? Uh, the, basically, if you imagine that our filament technology, as we understand it, is basically just scratching the surface. We're, we're only rolling the dice because we don't understand space-time the way that the Yan Yong understood space-time. They, they could calculate where they needed to be in order to trigger their systems to make it so that the Isogen 5 dumped them where they wanted to be. They used minute amounts of Isogen 5. They also developed weapon systems out that used Isogen 5 that would collapse shields and, you know, rip apart areas of space time to kill entire fleets. The Talakan. in contrast, developed the ability, the technology, to harness the power of stars, right? Where the, where the Yan Yong got their energy and their power for, for transportation by these really fi fine defects caused by the properties of Isogen 5, uh, which is extremely hard to harvest, by the way. Uh, the Talakan instead used this the power of a star harnessing its entire energy through their solar collectors to develop gateways and to warp reality in order to create a noinkus, a haven for them away from the Yanyong. The Yanyong began developing a way to battering ram their way into a noinkus. Unhappy, uh, for some reason, by this point, uh, this is interesting to note. For some reason, the Talakan uh, defended their their gateways to Anoikis by making them unusable by artificial intelligence, by requiring a physical body, which tells me that 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 believe they believe that that would defend them against their invaders, in this case, the Yanyong. So the Yanyong were strongly reliant on artificial intelligence or perhaps had begun to uh, separate, you know, um, 
separate their body from their conscious from their conscious or you know basically digitize their bodies or their consciousness and and slough their bodies uh thus this uh this one rule was a defense and necessitated the talican to instead develop uh robots to construct the caches of isogen 5 right so these masters of isogen 5 that use finite amounts of isogen 5 in order to uh transport their ships and moderate amounts relatively small amounts uh, like fractions of a little bit of a uh, amount just to fire off a huge gun that rips apart entire fleets they begin to develop these giant caches of isogen 5 now it is true that isogen 5 is basically first of all thought to be only theoretical before these caches were discovered but also believed to only uh exist in systems uh that are have a type ao or bo star which are you know blue really bright blue uh giants uh or you know whatever uh I, I might have gotten that wrong, but two of the two different blue stars, blue stars, whatever. Uh, Isogen 5, of course, as I, uh, you know, obviously it, its gravitonic properties makes it effectively a MacGuffin. Uh, OK, so. It I used to believe. That the one of the properties of Isogen 5 was that it was quantumly entangled, right? Thus, when they blew up the one cache of Isogen 5, it blew up all of the caches. But what I've realized is that that makes zero sense. And I'll tell you why. The weapon system that Jamil used was a Talican weapon system. And it said it used Isogen 5 both as its fuel and its flame. Um, this tells me that it is consuming Isogen 5, likely uh, through a process of destruction in order to get its energy. If Isogen 5 was quantumly entangled, if, if, the, if it was Isogen 5 itself that was quantumly entangled, then it would not, then that would have detonated all of the caches. No, the caches themselves were, had a trigger mechanism that was quantumly entangled or otherwise made so that that way the one trigger triggered them all through, you know, multi-locational signaling. However, however they do, it doesn't matter at this point. They were developing a system. They were developing and and creating a device using the largest amount of a, of an incredibly rare material harvested from these stars uh, that has ever been seen, all to go off at the same time. Why? I think it's, well, it's really simple. Look at the results. Like, let's just, let's just assume for a second that what we saw was at least more or less the plan. What we saw was each of those explosions going off dumping energy into their component stars, and then those stars giving off a, 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 a channel of energy that smashes into the first planet, uh, you know, or destroys the first planet among every, the things. Um, and, uh, but in the description, it says that uh, in the, from the book, it, or from the, actually, ah, I'm going to look up, I'm going to look, I, I'm going to, I have the, uh, let's, let's listen to, I got permission to listen to Templar 1. I'm going to total, we're going to listen to Isogen 5. We're going to listen to Concord's records on Isogen 5. I've been wanting to play this for you guys forever. Hold on. Let me, uh, uh, audible, right? There it is. No? Yes. Oh, I think I just look it up, right? Yeah. I just play it in browser. Hold on. I didn't think about this one. It, but it's worth it, man. Right? It's worth it. 
Can I just go Audible Templar one? Well, yay! Play, and then, okay, hold on. Okay, chapters, Genesis region, domain, black rays. The, this chapter is, there it is. It's, it's not hard. It's very hard to get this one wrong. All right, so this is from uh, EVE Online third book, Templar One, which is a book about the story of uh, the creation of the Dust 514 soldiers. Uh, and I'm sure that there's a link down there below that allows you to pick it up either on Audible or, uh, you know, on, in paperback, blah, 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 blah. Here we go. Zero B. Preliminary report. The apocalypse himself to perform oh, as a means of masking what I almost got it right all right chapter 8 Concord DED data stack 13A0B preliminary report the apocrypha event owner AI construct Argos 1 or inner circle select members of the DED and Concord Eyes only. Summary. On 10 March, YC-111, 10 star systems in the New Eden Cluster were struck by a previously unrecorded stellar event called a mass sequence CME anomaly. The cataclysm killed over 190 million people, the bulk of whom resided in the underground cities of Salin-1. The events appear to have been caused by the detonation of separate stockpiles of Isogen-5, which is a highly volatile, naturally occurring mineral found only in the proximity of Class O stars. Immediately following these explosions, concentrated waves of plasma emanating from the local sun dissipated throughout affected systems along a focused magnetic field, obliterating everything in their paths. Although each system affected by the catastrophe was host to a Class O star, there is no obvious pattern to their locations. However, each system was struck by identical events simultaneously, despite their physical separation by many light years. Shortly after the event took place, numerous space-time topological point defects, or wormholes, as they are more commonly called, began appearing throughout New Eden also with random frequency and distribution. To this point, the only naturally occurring wormhole in the entire cluster was the Eve Gate, which collapsed thousands of years ago. These new defects, literally tears in the fabric of space-time, were found to be stable enough to allow the passage of starships. Despite warnings that the egress point of these defects was unknown, and that their stability was likely temporary, and the Empyreans began traveling through. All ships entering these defects were transported to uncharted regions of space outside the New Eden Cluster. The nearest recognizable objects to onboard navigation systems were quasars, the oldest and most distant celestial objects in the known universe. If not for fluid router technology, these ships would have been completely isolated from known space and lost. Wormhole space, or W space as it soon came to be known, was also permeated with defects, all of which were unstable. As of now, there are hundreds of recorded instances in which wormholes have collapsed behind passing ships. Remarkably, most of these ships were able to navigate back to New Eden space by scanning down and then entering other defects. Although their destinations were unknown, Enough traversals eventually led back to the New Eden Cluster, although the points of re-entry were random. As detailed later in this report, the odds of these newly discovered defects all coincidentally pointing back to the New Eden Cluster are extremely small. The Sleeper Civilization Pilots entering W space have reported encounters with the automated defenses of an ancient and presumably extinct race of humans known as the Sleepers. While they are believed to be of Jove descent, very little is known about them. 
What is known, however, is that they were extremely advanced. Having mastered all present Foundation spacefaring and biomedical technologies thousands of years ago. But discovery of their reach across the universe, specifically their consistent appearance in W space systems, was completely unprecedented. The Apocrypha event, as this series of anomalies has been called, had the immediate political effect of temporarily distracting the empires from the Empyrean War. Despite the risks, Capsuleers began migrating to W space for two primary reasons to harvest pristine resources for sale and consumption in New Eden and to recover sleeper technology. The first sleeper artifact returned to New Eden possessed unique properties never before observed in applied materials science. It was manufactured from fullerene based polymorphic alloys capable of being adapted instantaneously to almost any engineering application. For example, two separate samples of the alloy, each of which has the same tensile strength as titanium construction alloy, could be fused into one seamless sample by applying uniform high voltage current through both specimens. Reversing the charge and the magnetic polarity of the sample breaks it into the original components. Overnight, demand for this new technology spawned a multi-billion credit industry for sleeper salvage, which in turn supported the emergence of a new class of warships called strategic cruisers. To cl so, just to be 100% on the nose, this explains why P3 ships are, are defined by their versatility and more importantly, their adjustability, right? The removal of rigs and the multi-positions um, because of these, um, th this, th it's made from this material that, um, can, can fuse and break apart basically at will. Clarify, ships are built to fill specific roles in naval warfare. In classical starship engineering, hulls are designed around core subsystems, such as weapons, propulsion, and power plant. Under this traditional methodology, the ship can perform only one role effectively. But those constructed using polymorphic alloys can be adapted to fill dozens of roles, since major subsystems can be swapped without compromising hull integrity. Concord has privately warned governments against using the technology because it is not fully understood. For example, we are unable to determine how these alloys are created. All attempts to synthesize them have failed. Yet every strategic cruiser that has ever been built is using material salvaged directly from sleeper artifacts. One retrieved sample suggests that the fullerene alloy was conceived for computing purposes, not structural engineering. Without understanding its origins or application, we are either underutilizing a potent new technology at best, or exposing ourselves to unimaginable risks at worst. By and large, the empires have heeded our warning. The capsuleers, however, have not. Their interest in sleeper tech continues unabated and for the time being, ungoverned. Mass sequence CME anomaly. All stars eject plasma during the main sequence stage of their lifespans over ranges, durations, and frequencies that vary with the age and type of star. Such stellar flares produce a stream of supercharged particles called proton storms, the speed of which is determined by the strength of the flare event itself. Storm speeds approaching the speed of light are rare among class G and smaller stars, although the spin rate of the star can create stronger magnetic fields and thus more powerful events. But they are fairly common in class M stars and higher. Stellar flares produce radiation across the entire electromagnetic spectrum, ranging from radio waves to gamma rays. The most powerful ones produce coronal mass ejections, or CMEs, where actual stellar material is cast off from the star and hurled into space. In the case of a class G star, the average mass and speed of ejected material is 1.6 times 10 to the 15th G at 15 kilometers per second. A CME usually begins with a pre-acceleration phase in an intense magnetic field above the star's surface. 
typically along the equator, but also above sunspots, whose appearance varies with the star's natural cycle. Plasma accretes and then enters a post-acceleration phase as trapped particles are accelerated quickly along closed magnetic field lines. Upon reaching critical volume and speeds, the plasma overwhelms the field and escapes into space. For a Class G star, the typical force released by this event is the equivalent of a billion megaton nuclear bombs. The Salin Star the Salin system is host to a potent but otherwise unremarkable Class O star, whose solar weather activity was monitored by a network of Federation satellites collectively known as Cassandra. At approximately 1100 hours local on 10 March YC 111, the last telemetry received from this network revealed several anomalies. That a drastic and unexpected shift in magnetic activity in the solar atmosphere had occurred that this field shift was oriented in the same plane and direction as the planet Salin 1, that an abnormally large solar prominence or pre-acceleration CME event filled this field almost instantly, that a separate, powerful gamma-ray burst was detected away from the star, but inside the orbit of Salin 1, and along the same plane as both the planet and the solar prominence. Less than ten minutes after Cassandra went offline, the side of Salin 1 facing the sun was struck by the largest proton storm ever recorded. A megadose of gamma and X-rays destroyed installations as deep as 30 meters below the surface, flash ionizing the air supply and igniting every surface within. Although the night side of the planet was somewhat shielded and thus spared the full brunt of the blast, the storm was still powerful enough to destroy the electrical grids supplying the underground cities of Lodecor and Southern Cross. If Salin 1 had an atmosphere to start with, it would have been vaporized entirely or blasted away into space. Several hours later, the ejected coronal mass, traveling at speeds approaching one quarter the speed of light and estimated to be orders of magnitude more massive than an average Class G event, slammed into the planet with enough force to break it apart, completely reshaping the world into molten rock and metal. The colonists who survived the initial radiation blast perished in the cataclysm that followed. Survivors who were evacuated from the system before the CME arrived suffered disfiguring burns and the immediate onset of aggressive forms of cancer. Of the millions who were killed, the vast majority were Federation citizens. In all, ten New Eden star systems, each with Class O or Class B blue stars, were struck with stellar anomalies identical to what occurred at Salin, all at the same time. Three additional uncharted W space systems have been discovered since the event, showing evidence of similar catastrophes striking at approximately the same time. Of the systems where solar weather data was recoverable, each one recorded identical anomalies. An unspeakably powerful magnetic shift and accelerated CME event with the local sun, along with the simultaneous, isolated detonation of concentrated gamma radiation from a location between the system's innermost planet and the sun itself. Of these affected systems, TIPZ provided us with the most clues as to the cause. TIPZ and the Terrans. System TIPZ was classified as a vital point of interest in the eyes only investigation of Empress Jamil's Zera Effect superweapon, named after the city above which the weapon was used with devastating effect against a Minmatar Elder Task Force. TIPZ was under Thanatos surveillance at the time of the Apocrypha event and reported identical solar anomalies before disappearing. Like Salin 1, the innermost planet of TIPZ was destroyed, and a gamma burst was traced back toward the vicinity of an ancient Terran station orbiting the same planet. The station, whose origins predate the closure of the Eve Gate by 14,000 years, was a location where an extremely rare and volatile mineral known as Isogen 5 was stockpiled. This mineral exists only in the presence of blue star systems, 
and loses its volatile properties when removed from its original locale. Isogen 5 possesses unique gravitonic properties whose behavior is not understood. Its scarcity and hostile native environment make it difficult to study. It is not known why the Terrans were stockpiling the material. Before its destruction, Thanatos discovered that drones manufactured autonomously within the station possessed the technology to move the material from its source to the station. Conventional ships cannot even approach it. Later it was discovered that the same technology that protects these drones is used in the Zera effect weapon housing, which requires the mineral as a primer to fire. But most importantly, Thanatos observed that the low orbit area where the weapon was fired remains symptomatic of dark matter collisions observable just outside the event horizon of black holes. Cross-brain gravitronic distortions in normal time space still resonate at both this site and the former site of the Terran station obliterated during the Apocrypha event. Subsequent Thanatos units confirmed that all ten Apocrypha locations contain the same post-event trace residue of an Isogen 5 detonation, all of which were presumably large enough to cause the immense gamma bursts recorded at each site. Argos 1 Conclusion Given these observable events, we summarize our findings as follows. The Isogen 5 stockpiles were entangled, either the detonators or the material itself. No other explanation can account for simultaneous events across multiple star systems. The purpose of the stockpile was to draw an energy yield from the sun that Isogen 5 by itself could not reach to achieve some kind of critical mass. The Terrans had the means to transport the material anywhere they wished. There is no discernible reason why they would need a structure so large and close to the star, except for the explicit purpose of amassing concentrations large enough to interact with the star. The energy expenditure was intended to be destructive. The lack of Terran structures anywhere else in the system, in addition to their placement in environmentally hostile locations near Class O stars, suggests that they were built with the intent to eventually destroy them. It is probable that the Terrans were constructing an interstellar transit system similar to, but much more advanced than our own Stargate transit system. The post-event gravitonic residue, Isogen 5 properties, placement near massive objects like Class O stars, resulting topological point defects and consistent presence of sleeper colonies in W space suggest that the Terrans already had jump technology, but were attempting to harness natural forces to achieve a similar result. The transit system was either incomplete when the event occurred, or was detonated incorrectly, or we do not yet understand how to use it. What appears to Empyreans as random wormhole activity may in fact follow a pattern, but no such analysis has been attempted. The New Eden's leading authority on sleepers was Dr. Marcus Dror, former chief scientist to Amarian holder Felix Grange. His whereabouts are currently unknown. He has been designated a Tier 1 surveillance target for Thanatos, pending acquisition of any information that could lead to to his discovery. End 13A0B. Okay, so uh, first of all, we don't need to accept all of their conclusions, um, but there's a lot of interesting information in there, right? So this is where we get information like the fact that it's quantumly entangled and, you know, the, the types of stars, all that kind of jazz. Um, the idea that the gate technology already existed... Um, now I, obviously it would seem as if, uh, the sleepers actually got there afterwards, but the Talican were there beforehand. Um, when, again, when they say Terran, it, we can't really, we don't know, but the only two, like truly, the only two races that we can really call out is all the way back to, or as being Terran powers at that in that days were the Talican and the Enyal. So we know that the Talican made the the gates. That was the unnatural way 
of creating portals to uh, Anoikis. And this was, the, I believe, it, it would appear as if, if you just look at the results and you imply intent from the results, then you would say that they are attempting to make a way to make their own bridges into Anoikis, right? Without the ability to use the star's gate tra uh, tracks, uh, the Talic the Yanyong would be unable to invade or infect um, the the Talican. So they had to create a battering ram, and so began to construct this process. And if you notice, it's automated, right? The robots are automatically manufactured internally to the system. Therefore, they didn't even have to finish the project. They only had to start it, right? So this process was started. They began the process of building these caches to break in to Anoikis. And I believe that the, that, uh, the Talican responded by shutting off the Eve Gate, by destabilizing the Eve Gate. Um... And that was that basically resulted in its intended consequence, which was that the Yan Yong, which was mostly control, you know, because they controlled New Eden, they controlled access to Earth. They were the Earth side of things. The Talican were the guys like the far plane, basically. Like they had they had not only gone to New Eden, but then they had leapfrogged out of New Eden to create a Noikis. So knowing what the Yan Yung was up to, the Talican purposefully disrupt and destroy the Eve Gate. This has the intended effect of cutting off the Yan Yung, who are completely unprepared to, um, to respond to this. And uh, through this in their war, they collapsed. However, what remained was quite possibly the Yan Yung's gift to us all. The AI virus. The Talican became infected. They needed quarantine, and it was, and it's still not quite unknown uh, whether or not the Talican were referring to a biological weapon or a computer virus. Knowing that the Talican protected their systems specifically against the AI, perhaps the threat that they were running from was an AI nightmare. Maybe this is they it could have driven off the Talican or perhaps uh you know whatever it is, but here comes the AI. Either way, the AI does begin to infect the Talican Empire enough that they have to flee. So that way when the sleepers return to Talican space, they discover that their empire uh is gone. Now, this goes under the theory that the Talican helped foster the Jovian people and helped teach them and, and help build them into from the Talic or from the Jove into the sleepers. You know, there was the statics um, and the, that were in the construct uh, and then they were biologically manipulated. It could be possible that that biological manipulation came from the Talican. Um, either way, the uh, and this is so the this is necessary because the sleepers knew how to get back to Talican space. So this AI gets out and it begins to infect uh, the Talican systems. Thanks for the follow. So the Talican develop their ultimate weapon, a recursive antivirus that they would inflict against the artificial sapiens. They believe it worked, or maybe their empire just collapsed. But either way, the side effect was that it destroyed a, a large amount of the sleeper civilization. And in fear, the sleeper returned back to the, first, uh, to the Jovian Empire. Now, while all of this was going on, of course, the fledgling Jovian Empire, which was uh, barely large enough to be considered a, a set of colonies uh, for, for a lot of this compared to these other two empires... Um, they had developed these seven planets, and from there, they created enclaves. And when they formed together, their enclaves finally came together in an agreement, so that way they could all work together as one, which became the first Jovian Empire, right? 
and uh, the idea of like statics and modifiers even comes from this earliest days, and it's born from the very people who helped shepherd the architects on their way. So the the ta uh, the Enheduani, which were the caretakers of the sleepers, the er or rather the the proto drove on their on their arc travel, the Enheduani were the ones that were not preserved in the stasis chamber. Now this wasn't hundreds of years. It was like 30 years of a journey for their, for their ship. Um, but this could lead them to be interested in extending their life through other techniques, right? They don't, they don't want to die. They just don't, they're not allowed to be in suspended animation. And so, more and more, they begin to experiment with ways to extend their own lives as they uh, look after the ones in the artificial uh, simulation. Even as they shepherd individuals out of the construct and maybe help people in and out, these caretakers of the construct are not blessed with the ability of longevity like the rest of them. And so they develop increasingly extreme methodology to extend their life. So this group, now called the Elders, uh, at some point more, more or less become the de facto leaders by proxy. These architects, which were basically the great thinkers of the Jovian Empire, um, they could only communicate to the rest of the people through these Edheduani, the caretakers and communicators. And it would seem that at some point, these uh, architects used this opportunity to, um, to attempt to project their view on the world, uh, their, their view on everybody within the empire, right? So by this point, the elder faction had uh, kind of finished doing what they needed to do. They were part of the statics, so they don't believe that there there needed to be change. We need to. They they be, they are convinced by this by the sleepers for some reason. The elders decide that nobody should none of the Jove should continue their advancements in biology, uh, it, and manipulation of their own biology. Um, now, the problem is, is that the Jovian Empire was still basically just enclaves that worked together, right? Um, they're not, like, they're almost like city-states, right? So, they function because they all got along with each other. But once the Empire attempted to basically make them all have to follow, you know, when they started to legalize, that's the word I was looking for, when they were, when they began to legalize their uh, very conservative uh, static nature, what you saw was civil war and a ripping apart of the empire. The first Jovian Empire falls. Um, this is probably the real reason why Grius can't answer the question, because it would bring shame to the it had you on e. Um, so this leads to uh, the Edhediwani and the Sleeper faction are not destroyed. They're still there. They're just one of the enclaves of these different disparate enclaves. Uh, or maybe two, if you want to consider it that. Uh, until Michael Bohr reunites the Empire through force and basically creates an effective Senate from each of the enclaves, right? Cool. Well done. We can now go go forward. But given the fact that the that the statics so failed them in the previous iteration, this time it was the modifier's turn, right? Valamir says, but I thought the Eve Gate closed behind the initial travelers. It was open for several years. I can't remember how many years. Uh, I think like 70. I, I can't remember exactly. 
Um, they actually even built a literal gate around it to try to keep it open once it started to destabilize. Um, shoot, where was I? Uh... Shoot, where was I? I needed a breather anyways. Yes, now the modifiers were in charge. Modifiers want to change things. So they get to work and they start, you know, advancing their, their bi biology in incredible leaps and bounds. Um, they do such radical things as removing aggression from their very DNA. They remove sexual urges from their DNA. They no longer have, like, they, 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 they manipulate, they basically force selected or however you want to call it, um, the, the desire, like sexual impulse out of their, their dry, uh, out of their, um, being mostly because long before this point, the Jovians had transitioned completely to test tube clones at that point. Um, at some point one of the most extreme of the modifier clans likely broke everything. Maybe it was intentional. Maybe it was accidental. But a degradation was introduced into the entire Jovian, uh, um, the entire Jovian species, or, you know, whatever you want to call it, uh, their d DNA. It corrupted all of it. And this defect is basically a degradation, right? It, 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 it erodes the mind and eventually drives them to be like into lizard people mode or into madness and eventually kills them. Um, this is of course the Jovian disease. The Empire reels from this and turn to the architects and beg for a solution. And the architects, uh, sorry, the, uh, yeah, now the sleepers, the, um, yeah, they, the only answer they, sorry, uh, what are they called? Um, the stasis faction, the only thing that they could say was if you come into the construct, the suspended animation will preserve you. And given the fact that that was the solution, the rest of the Jove Empire turned on the sleepers, right? Which drove the sleepers off. They, they accused the sleepers of constructing the the virus to cause people to have to clearly the statics are at it again they are attempting to manipulate us into all becoming like them so the empire once again tears themselves apart and each of the uh, but this time there are three different ways that people try to escape the sleepers flee Knowing a secret way, you know, knowing access to an, one of the various Talakan entry, you know, star points, because W477 TAC-P allegedly isn't the only one. The sleepers flee to Talakan space, only to find their Talakan now uh, having abandoned it completely. The Edhediwani continuing their pursuit of everlasting life, discover a way to make the body, the physical body, no longer a concern. Either they manage to create some sort of like Stargate level ascension where they literally become a force ghost, or they found some place to retreat and hide and also have the technology to basically uh, affect anything anywhere uh, to a certain extent. And so they basically manipulate things from this isolated chamber. 
to us, it's effectively the same. There is, um, you know, the, the, the Hedjuwani have effectively become space ghosts, right? They can look into people's minds. They can uh, do some minor manipulation. They can talk to people. Uh, they can, well, actually, it's not even proven that, yeah, I think that they can read minds, but it says that they can manipulate neural passageways to make it so that you can hear them speak. Uh, this is, you know, freaky stuff. But, you know, that's how the Talakan take care of it. They, they basically, or not the Talakan, that's how the Hedjuwani take care of it. They remove themselves from the equation entirely. The elders, uh, at least part of the elders, ascend in one way or another. A third group, the modifiers. In fact, likely the most extreme branch of the modifiers didn't just believe that did not believe that the Jovian disease was a sign that they had gone too far. Quite the contrary. This group of modifiers believed that it was signs that they had not gone far enough. That they must push through this. That the only way forward is through. And that only through... Uh, Manipulate or like uh, continuous biological advancement, bringing out you know, were they able to perfect themselves? They at some point also became di diaspora within the Jovian uh, Directorate or within the Jovian Empire, Second Jovian Empire, and uh, they either were banished or fled into deep into subspace into uh, what is now known as Buyan, the edge of which we know of as the abyss. That is the shrouded that is and that basically culminates in the end of the shrouded days. So there you have it. The Eve Online history from Eve Gate to Shrouded Days. I guarantee you some of that is wrong. I, I, I preface this at the beginning. I'll preface it again at the end. Hey, Nova. Uh, did, did I get raids? Thank you for the raids. <laughs> uh, sorry. Um... Neon Olympus, thank you for joining us down there. I have a whole team online. I, I said at the beginning, I'll say it at the end. Um, today, I didn't want to talk about, like, evidence until I got the entire story out. I just, now that I thought I could tell the entire story from start to finish, I wanted to say my current, like, I have a grand narrative that actually tells the story. Like, you could write that, that, that was a cohesive narrative. I don't know if it's 100% right. Um, and I'm, I'm free to debate it with, with people who disagree with me. Uh, so do the Triglavians suffer from the Jovian disease? You know, I don't think it matters anymore. I think that, uh, so their suit are causing all kinds of bio manipulations. There's little needles inside of them. Um, and you can see that they're also testing people for their capacity, um, to evolve. Disappointing you don't... Oh, ah. Maybe I should have done that or next time or whatever. Are the Glavians Jovian? So, by this theory, they would be the modifiers. Yep. But that also explains why they're basically doing the Talakan thing. Because they knew the Talakan Empire. Right? This also... Uh... So the Talakans see themselves as separate. Oh, so one of the nice things about this is it explains why the Talakans see the Second Jovian Empire as the ancient enemy as Daja. Because the Second Jovian Empire turned against them and hunted them down and or imprisoned them. Therefore, uh, any identification with the ancient enemy as Daja, who cares? They need to be destroyed. They, they're, the, they, they're, they're our biggest enemy. They are the ancient enemy. 
the second Jovian Directorate. What if they're Talokan? Yeah, well, I mean, the evidence uh, for them being the Talokan, being the Jovian Talokan, uh, or the Jovian Triglavian Polity being sleepers, um, which doesn't really jive with the Talokan, with the uh, Triglavians being Jovian. Um, but, so the, the thing about the, the Talokan basically being the progenitors of the sleepers that was based on the echoes thing right i don't actually think that there's any evidence of that other than the fact that they knew the way to get there um and there could be other reasons why like you know there's very likely they even if they didn't have you know that level of agreement they may have still out act, known the talican and had like emissaries or whatever. So this either way, um, the sleepers would know the way to get to the Talokan or uh, Empire area. Now, one of the interesting questions there is: if the Talokan, if the tr if the sleepers fled, how? If Assuming that the other Talokan structures, uh, if they are, if there are any, are uh, locked to AI, I wonder how they would trigger it. I mean, I guess they have their drones and stuff, but then why? Either way, I don't want to go down that rabbit hole. But so, if you assume that the sleepers had a different reason why they were able to find the way to get to Anoikis, um then it's fine. And so this also explains why the Adhedyuani knew about the existence of the other, which, by the way, in this narrative, the other is the reemergence of the ancient uh, Yanyong AI. I forgot to throw that in there. Um, so that infection that never left came, comes back as the other and begins to basically absorb sleeper culture and then later the 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 broader second jovian empire's culture as a way of becoming a thing it's it's pursuit so if this this theory doesn't necessarily say that the Talokan or the Triglavians are modifiers or um well it, basically it seems to me like it would make sense that the Talokan would be a radical sect sorry the Triglavians would be a radical sect of the Jove and the reason why they refer to Jovian Triglavian so satellite polity is they uh that's what it is Hold on. So, what if the Second Jovian Empire... Sorry. What if the Triglavians refer to the Second Jovian Empire as a Triglavian and... Uh, Triglavian-Jovian society, right? Um... at least the parts of it that they were part of. The reason why I say that is because the satellite polity could have been the sleepers, and it's just the Triglavians' way of lumping themselves within it, within it right? Both the Triglavians and the, the Triglavian faction and the, uh, the, uh, some other group out of the Jovians, uh, uh, the... Riley... Glorification to you, sir. Uh, so, okay. Where was I? The Triglavians and the uh, Stasis basically together sent a 
a contingent of them to go live with the Talakan as a sign of like good, good faith or whatever. And that's the group that the Talakan experimented on. And maybe even, and they taught biomanipulation uh, to the Triglavi, or to, to the modifier group. And they taught, uh, they mu mutated the statics to turn them into sleepers. And when that all collapsed, they all together went back to, to um, the, the, the first Jovian Empire. And that is the Jovian Triglavian polity, satellite polity, as opposed to the expansionist polity, which was the second Jovian Empire's polity, or, you know, had a, a military group, an expansionist polity, a society that, of, about pushing outward uh, and taking over. Which is what they are, uh, what they ref basically the only way that they refer to, or the only polity that they refer to in the Second Jovian Empire. Uh, well, so we know about the infection and containment in the Talakan. We know a lot more about the Talakans and than the Yanyongs. The Yanyong is basically just they mysteriously disappeared. But really, the Yanyong story depends on whether or not you uh, you take. Um, uh, you take the, what's it called? Um, Echo's lore as canon, which nobody likes to do. Um, and therefore, that's the reason why I like this. Like, if you can create a solution that explains the pieces without having to rely on, um, on the Echo's lore, then I think you have a winning proposition. Also, Delegate Zero said that things had been changed in the background but something that wasn't necessarily something that we knew about, but something in, in the backstory that wasn't really public knowledge did get changed at some point. He said it was for the Triglavians, but I, it could very well have been uh, for uh, you know, other things too. But my point is, is that the, the Edheduani... The, the relationship between the story that is told about the Adhediwani and the Sleepers and what we know about this First and Second Jovian Empire not driving together has always bothered me. And so the fact that we can explain that story without relying on the... Um, without relying on the Echo's lore because we have pieces of evidence within, you know, we can work within just the lore that we have and we can still explain it and say that it's like, that works. I think that it's very possible that at one point the sleepers were created by the, by the Talakan, but that was maybe one of the details that was changed um, at some point. But then the Echoes guys got an older version of the lore Bible and therefore had that incorrect data. Uh, that's, that's, I'm increasingly suspicious that that is what happened. Um, so, how did the Talakan disappear? Uh, so this is one of the things I really want to investigate more. It frustrates me how little we have documented about this. In fact, I was looking for the Eric Jalan project, uh, website stuff the other day and I couldn't find it and I'm terrified that like uh like that website I thought it was part of backstage I'm gonna have to start reaching out to figure out what happened or if I'm just an idiot because there's an archive of everything that was discovered and figured out and talked about during Eric Jalan project um and basically there is an incredible amount of information in in wormhole space, including hidden triggers, uh, descriptions, uh, weird things about names, like you you name it, right? Oh, here's a great one. Uh, here's a bit of an aside. So the very first thing, the thing, I, you know what I was going to talk about today before this, before I went down this goddamn rabbit hole? Sancha Kavaki. I was like, oh, it's winter event. We could talk about Sancha. It'll be fine. And I start pulling up the stuff 
And the very first thing I say, because I start thinking out loud, like to myself, what am I going to talk about when it comes to Sancha? And I was like, well, I'm going to do the same thing that I do with all of the things I talk about nowadays, which is the first thing I'm going to do is check to see if there's any meaning behind the actual words themselves. I assumed I would have thought of or seen it by now, uh, but I might as well check. And what I discovered was that I might get this backwards. Sancha means people, like the, of the people, like the people in Japanese. And kuvaki means icon in Finnish. So that would make Sancha kuvaki an icon of the people, right? Ashrathi, that's madness. You're stretching. That's, that's why would, if you look up any random jumble of letters, you'll find it means something somewhere. Get over it. Yeah, except, except, ah, there's no way that it's deliberate, except there are two languages used within the Kaldari state. Japanese and Finnish. Get wrecked. There's no way that's not deliberate. He's Kaldari. That's what those words would mean to the Kaldari. So, names have meaning in Eve. It's worth looking into them. Uh, specifically, uh, uh, Drop Bear. Oh my God, dude, you missed you missed the br brunt of it. Uh, we are. T I'm talking about basically. I've 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 been discussing my grand theory of uh, of Eve Online. I also completely stopped doing the mission because uh, my my uh, my material got overwhelmed, and so I was going to switch to the Paladin. But then I got distracted talking to you guys, so that's fine. Um, yeah, I, if anybody wants to get me caught back up. Ashes to getting into coast to coast AM radio conspiracies as well. Man, I I grew up with this might surprise you, but I grew up with it coast to coast AM. I I remember uh when I was like 17, 18 years old, I, I listened to it like every night. Uh they have the similar sentence structure, not sure, but they might uh belong to the same family. I understand that, but what I'm saying is that when I looked into it. The Cal I mean, like, we already know that the Kaldari use a lot of Japanese words. That's not confusing. But it was when I looked up whether or not there was any association with uh, Finnish in EVE Online, and I found a bunch of people asking if the Kaldari were Finnish because all these words that they're using are Finnish. I was like, oh my god, that's just too fucking perfect. Yes, Art Bell. So, yeah, I guess my point, again, my point is, is that that story is cohesive and more or less completely built on information exclusively to EVE Online without relying on any of the information that was exposed in EVE Echoes. Huh. No, Sancha Kuvaki was born Kaldari. And therefore, his name is a mix of Japanese and Finnish words. So, the this is actually what led into the original tinfoil. So, the Galente Prime, uh, what is it? VF four seven one, VF Tech four seven one. I think that's it. Isn't that it? Some. Somebody in chat, tell me if that if uh, if that's correct. Um, either way, the uh, planet uh, Galente Prime, which, which is now Galente Prime, was colonized by a bunch of Frenchmen from Tau Ceti. That's just what they say. So all of the true Galente are descendant from Frenchmen. The Asian 
and other uh, appearing people within the Galente Federation are other groups that they've run into. So the true Galente are French. The Caldari was purchased, purchased, Caldari Prime was purchased by a mega corporation, surprise, surprise, uh, that a, a Terran mega corporation, and they performed a major terraforming operation on the planet with the majority, with the planet, with the, with the population living beneath the surface of the planet prior to, uh, you know, um, for many, many, many years, even after the Eve Gates collapse, until the terraforming was complete, and only then did they emerge and begin to build their societies. To the point where, even by the time the Galente came there, like, the Rata Empire was huge, and it was the biggest group of the Kaldari, but they were never united, right? Um, and, and this factionalization within the Kaldari state, or within the Kaldari people, within the race of the Kaldari, the fact that they are a multiracial group, and those races were divided by continents. There were four disconnected continents that they uh, grew up on. This created a kind of racism baked into the state, or to the Kaldari people, which on the one hand is kind of, could be seen as ne negative, but on the other hand led them to a certain xenophobia and lack of trust of, of other you know, people outside of themselves that led to them not trusting the Galente and eventually, you know, going their own way. So, yeah. Well, the fulleride foil is nice because if you put a charge through it with, uh, you know, uniform polarity, it'll fuse with another piece of foil. And then if you put it with the same amount of charge in reverse polarity, or reverse the charge and reverse the polarity, they'll break apart it again. There's a fair chunk of people in here that have no idea, like, that was, thought that that was completely random. Uh, <laughs> one of those Kaldari groups had to be English and, and could smell the French on the Galente. Uh, the story of the, eth of the Galente and the Kaldari is hilarious. Let me pull that up real quick. We'll do that for a little bit. Um, Galente. The, the, how, how you can tell that Eve Online is racist. The history of Eve is told as the history of the Amar Empire and the Galente. <laughs> In fact, it's actually the history of the ethnic Galente. Uh... All right, hold on. I thought this was going to make it easier. It's not. Hold on. How can you tell you online is racist mainstream corporate news? I, 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 I want at this point, I want to argue. I want to make sure to throw out there that it's OK for it to be there to be racism in Eve online. Because it's a dystopia, right? Like, this is a commentary about power and corruption and how corruption uses power on people in four different lenses, right? <laughs> so, any hoozle. <laughs> Let me see. Here is the history of the ethnic Galente, uh, Galente. It's just one giant chronicle. It used to be divided, or one giant article. It used to be bait, uh, you know, based on um, it used to be separated.
Here we go. Uh, yeah, cultural expansion. The dominance of the Galente over the Caldari meant that the modern society of the latter effectively became a product of the former. A Caldari nation state uh, was shaped to have a civilian government ruling over citizens with codified legal rights and entrenched bureaucracies, along with a free market and capitalist modes of production. Through the centuries on both planets, or though the uh, count, sorry, though the countries on both planets would remain fundamentally po polar opposites on cultural and social levels, with the Galente leaning towards liberal and Caldari towards more authoritarian, they followed the same structure styles regardless. This became known as the Luminaire model and became the most prolific exports of the Galente civilization, going so far as to influence structures of contemporary interstellar society. Um, a notable vehicle of G Galente cultural... Hold on. There we go. Uh, a notable vehicle of Galente cultural projection took place in uh, whatever 22631 AD. The Cultural Deliverance Society was founded by several Galente philanthropists, business tycoons, and many other multinational figures. This was a uh, this was a response to the instability and low-level armed con conflict, low-level armed conflict that had erupted on the Caldari homeworld as a result of planetary politics being unable to adapt so quickly to these sudden technological leap. Though it was explicitly apolitical and did not represent any one nation of the Galente Prime, it was discovered decades later that the CDS had the funding of several major powers on the homeworld at the time. It arrived on Caldari Prime that year and set up several endeavors across most Caldari nations, including but not limited to charities, schools, and humanitarian uh, projects. The CDS also introduced... Oh, hold on. Before we get... Yeah. The CDS also introduced corporate capitalism to the Caldari to a more extensive degree, with the first Caldari megacorporation being founded in 22684, uh, three, no, uh, 53 years after the cultural society, known as Is Isuada, born of the Cultural Deliverance Society and the International Space Agency, went a long way to influencing the modern cultural society, Caldari society, with Galente concepts over the years, through Caldari, though Caldari cl culture was resilient enough to adopt many ideas for their own benefit. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, was resilient enough to adopt many ideas for their own benefit instead of being war warped completely. An example of this was the Mega Corporation, which combined Caldari pragmatic authoritarianism with the collective outlook perfectly. Okay, so let's take a step back. Let's take a step back and think about that. Okay, so when these when first contact happens, the Federation or sorry, the Galente people had entered into the uh, space era, obviously. So information age, right? So let's let's consider. Basically, it would be the equivalent of when we landed or you know right before we landed our first rover on the on the uh on mars we actually picked up signs of of light actually more importantly uh it, if there was life on mars and so once we were able to look at mars close enough we discovered that there was other people on mars and so we built our society up to go contact them right so we have Basically, the technology of at least the modern era, uh, while as the Kal Kaldari are just entering into the Industrial uh, uh, Revolution and still recovering from the collapse of the Rada Empire. Um, so imagine going from like... Victorian era to modern era technology in like 20, 30 years. Imagine what that would do to our society. Look, look around uh, or to that society, I should say. Look around us now at how much changes in technology are causing 
unrest as older methods of, of thinking and working give way to newer ways of thinking and working and different power, you know, rises to play and et cetera, et cetera. Um, so there's unrest on the Kaldari in the Kaldari state due to all, oh, sorry, on Kaldari prime, uh, mostly thanks to this gift of technology from the Galente. And so the Galente think to themselves, ah, I know the solution. We will create cultural centers on Kaldari prime. They, they're, they're all, the cure to their instability is that we are going to a openly attempt to overcome their culture. That is so Galente, right? The solution here, oh, oh, well, the problem isn't the technology and the need for it to be adapted and, you know, while at the same time the Kaldari people be allowed to figure things out a little bit for themselves, this rapidly uh, adapting civilization, they, they need to be empowered to handle it themselves. No, 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 no. They're doing it wrong. Let us help you. And the solution was the instatement of the mega corporation. The very thing that takes over when the Galente sham of a government falls apart. And the very entities that end up getting in trouble with the Federation for having secret colonies that they expanded into that they didn't feel like they needed to report because they're mega corporations and not the government. This war is the, the 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 history behind these two pe two people are uh, complicated. You can't you say that's a wasted effort, but at the same time, within seventy years, the Kaldari's technological uh, within seventy years, the Kaldari had overtaken the Galente uh, in technological um, revolution. Because the thing is, is that like the Galente was and always has been fairly decadent, right? Um, and, and for for certain liberal, which say what you will about authoritarian regimes, assuming that they're working good and not just a you know uh, a sham or whatever, but like assuming that it's ran by uh, an intelligent. Assuming that an authoritarian regime is ran by the stereotype that authoritarian regime leaders wish to think of themselves as, if you want to follow that logic, you know, that perfect authoritarian leader, whatever. Assuming that you have uh, decent leadership within an authoritarian society, that society is far, far more equipped to capitalize on such a thing, right? Mobilizing their civilization to get something done, um, to, to work because working as a collective and for the good of the collective is baked into their society. Whereas the individualistic, uh, Galente, uh, would have had to convince people to do as much, if that makes sense. Kaldari are Japanese to Galente's. Oh, I see. Yeah. Well, the Kaldari are largely based off of Japanese culture. And the Galente are pretty much U.S. Yeah. Uh, well, no, no. no. The, 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 uh, so the perfect... Uh, sorry. So Gal Cal prefer a cultural warfare. Amari and Mimitar prefer kinetic warfare. I mean, the Kaldari Mimitar... Or Kaldari Galente love use of force as well. The point I was making here is this idea of, so the democracy, I'll say it this way. I'm going to be direct. Today is the blunt day where Ash says what he thinks and doesn't have to justify himself. 
uh, when it comes to the lore. So, the Galente use democracy to cover up their takeover of other civilizations. The Galente absorb and attempt to eradicate other civilizations, right? So this is what they did with the Kaldari, right? If you come down here and you see that, here we go, uh, they encounter the Intaki and the Manar. Both of these were primitive, pre-industrial level of development, so earlier than the Kaldari when they were first encountered, but were swept up in the modern age uh, with one swift stroke. Boom. The ethnic Galente were very keen to interact with the two new races. The Intaki quickly developed the democracy as an organic development with the min minimal Galente in influence. Uh, the Intaki people are very Janist. Um, uh, Daoist, uh, probably. It would be, uh, you know, whatever. Like, Eastern, think... I don't... I'm not going to finish that. But the Minar... Uh, making the two cultures naturally affinitive to one of them. Uh, meanwhile, the Menar's loud, expressive, and somewhat alien culture meshed well with the Glente's artistry, creating numerous uh, hybrid offshoots before the lines ultimately blurred. However, the Menar's stubborn and xenophobic tendencies resulted in some friction. Many felt that the Amar, uh, Menar were a mixture of Glente and Caldari cultures. Uh, hold on. Ah, I don't think that this tells the story. I'm going to have to figure out. Hold on. Oh, well. Uh, so the Menar is, is, a, is an interesting st uh, deal. Because if I remember correctly, that was the planet where there was like a a ruling group there was you know a government there was you know an empire whatever you want to call it and then there were like rebels renegades and the galente uplifted the renegades right so imagine medieval warfare and then suddenly one side is given tanks and machine guns like that's pretty much what happened there. So, again, they weren't interested in the, what the Menar people were. They were only interested in making them Galente. Does that make sense? And ultimately, when it all came down, they, uh, there was an unfortunate calamity which the Galente have recently... Uh, thanks to the new president, uh, during the mining event stuff, one of the things that they put up was that they are doing a big project to attempt to re-terraform Menar to make it habitable again. Uh, but there's pretty strong accusations that the Galente Federation sabotaged the entire planet in order to... Uh, Force the Menar to be indebted to them, reliant on them, if that makes sense. So, uh, say what you will about authoritarianism and, and slave states, the Galente are genocidal, are a genocidal society in this, insofar as they destroy as much as they can any culture, uh, that they come across. Uh, the, uh, additionally, in the history of the ethnic Galente story, I mean, it talks about like how they begin to, they continue to expand uh, and they even fight over different areas uh, of expansion and whatnot, which is why they need to put in this military. Uh, some of this is, I think that, that this is, doesn't tell the full story, but I, I'll look it up. Um, and 
So the Intaki and the Minar were not the only two civilizations besides the Kaldari that the Galente encountered. It's just all of the other civilizations were so sussumed that we don't even know their name anymore. That's that's what I'm talking about. Let's let's keep that in mind. Yeah, and if you look, they did it again with the Mimitar, right? They said, we're going to help you out, but we're going to make you be a democracy. Now, the Mimitar were like, okay, fine, we're going to make a democracy, but we're going to make the democracy answer to the tribal council. Uh, a feudal democracy led by racial purists? Um, well, no, they're not racial purists, they're cultural purists. They, they don't think that they are racially better than everybody, but they are so much of a believer in their own democracy that they want to bring as many people under it as possible. And let's combine that with the fact that, so one of the other pieces to this, let's see if it talks about this. Um... No, I don't think. Yeah, here we go. Uh, cynics would simply point. Um, yeah, here we go. This was seen as justification and required to initially center the new federation around the Galente homeworld. The first, so so. Yep, this federation is for all of us, but its headquarters is our planet. It's named after our planet, and our population is the biggest. And it's, uh, it's absolute vote, and therefore, whatever Galente Prime wants, everybody else get wants too, because it doesn't matter, because we have more people than you. Sorry. You, you want, you want to get your way in, in the Senate, well, I, get more people. And that's what the Caldari the Caldari are famous for having less people than the Galente. So that was inherently the problem, right? Everyone will be happy as long as they are with us. So in that sense, it's it's more like Rome, right? Like we're not here to destroy you. We're here to liberate you from your primitive life and thinking. And we're here to give you a better t life and a better way of thinking. Kind of insidious. If everybody would just take the Sanche implants, none of this would be a problem. I mean, technically true. All right, let's see what I can do. Uh, screw it, I'll come back for stuff later if I need to. As long as I got me crystals. Arthur C. Clarke wrote uh, this novel, Childhood End. It touches on a similar subject. Uh, which similar subject? Love drive active. Um, I will say this, though. Given what we know about uh, CCP's use of names and the meaning behind names and the language... Um, it's really worth keeping an eye on all of the words that the Triglavians use, like the names that the Triglavians use. Theriactum's Foucault is, um, both of those names are very interesting. 
oh, we are going to help you evolve out of your primitive ways. Speaking of which, I was playing Stellaris the other day. Um, anybody want me to actually play Stellaris on stream? All right, let's do this. Screw your damps. There, no, there's no acceleration gate. This is a single pocket. All right, cool. Maybe I've actually never played with the, uh, with like a completely destructive way. I actually usually play hive, hive mines. But I've started a new one. I'm usually mostly about like researching technology and stuff and then building up advanced technology, more advanced technology than everybody else. So, especially in the early game, I want to get along with people. So, again, I want to remind everybody though, starting Friday, uh, I will be streaming as much as possible um, Final Fantasy XIV. So probably Thursday or tomorrow I will, uh, on stream, will watch a video uh, on YouTube. We'll, you know, whatever. Together we'll watch this video that kind of does a good recap of the story so far. Um, and then we will jump into the finale of the story on uh, starting on Friday uh, and we'll do it all together so like massive spoilers and all that stuff uh, can we be cat girl friends Sh absolutely especially after the expansion because then it doesn't matter what server cluster you're on I normally make a race of turtles and destroy all the no shells uh, I like yeah, I like hive mind. I, I like hive minds that want to assume everybody else, right? Kind of Galente in that way, but not really democracy. But definitely the uh, bring everybody under heel. Kaldari do have a tendency to use drones. Speaking of which, there was uh, a final uh, a Eve Online. Uh, what's it called? Um, an Eve Online mod mod for Stellaris, but it's apparently been gone for a long time. So unfortunate. But I do. One of the things I've always wanted to do is make like a set of pre-mades for all of the uh, organization, all of the major organizations, both both Empire and Pirate, you know? I made a race based on the Chua from Wildstar. I think I've played that one. But, uh, no, what inspired me to do that was the fact that, you know, there's literally an expansion called Mega Corporation or some, Mega Corp or whatever. So, like, well, if they're going to, like, have an entire expansion to introduce the Kaldari state mechanics, then uh, we might as well see what's going on. You can, of course, make like a religious, a religious group that wants to enslave everybody. I just wish that you could like 
Or right, I have no idea how you would make like the map. It'd be really cool if you could make the map and have everything start out where they're supposed to. And just see what happens. A module has run out of charges. Ooh. Got to level 80, finished what I thought was the end of Stormblood, and they go, oh no, now you have to do these stupid quests before starting Sh Shadowbringer. Ah, uh, yeah. I, I, thought, I thought that the, the change from AAR to Heavensward was the worst when it came to like, because when do they force you to do the Crystal Tower? Is that at the end of no, that's that's in AAR, right? Because they, the Crystal Tower storyline didn't used to be required by the M MSQ. They added that as a requirement later on. And that's all I'm going to say about that. So you're level 80 and you're not even entering into Shadowbringers yet, I would strongly recommend leveling a different class from 70 while you do the MSQ then. Otherwise, you're just throwing away all that experience. Yeah, I was the same. The problem is, is that, like, in a weird way, there is no end game, and also the end game is everywhere. Because all of the raids are still relevant. Uh, okay, so here's a silly noob question. I love those. Uh, other than the clone in a pod, are there actual crew members on our ships? Absolutely. Uh, especially frigates and above. Or Yeah, sorry, uh, destroyers and above. Frigates can be made to be manned without any other crew, but uh, any ship larger than that is designed to have a much smaller crew, but they still need a crew. You're... Your maintenance can't be 100% aut uh, automated. You wouldn't trust... You Would you really trust automation to manage your ship? What happens if something goes wrong? You can't just decant because you haven't been scanned in a long time. If something was to happen when you decant, you would, you would have to go to a, you know, a long-term backup. Uh, yes. So, as far as crews go, um, A, they have really good insurance. Um, B, the, they, there are, like, escape pods. And I believe that the, the hand waviness is the fact that civilian vessels are not, uh, monitored. Like, our equipment is explicitly designed to not the uh, certain things, such as civilian ships. They just don't register on our overview, because our overview registers military and stuff. Uh, that's why you can see those little dots going back and forth in Vita, and you don't have a million bot, you know, AI driven things on your overview. Um, so there, there are crew escaping from those ships. Now, What's interesting about that is uh, they, uh, they, there is a comment. Tenford, thank you for joining us down the rabbit hole, Steve Online. There's a comment about Titans, because Titans end up uh, like they, there's something about their core goes critical quicker. And they're larger, uh, and therefore, m more portion of the crew are killed in Titans. Disproportionate a number of the crew are are killed in a Titan loss than a normal ship. Uh, and also, the Sisters of Eve put out a denouncement of Capsuleers for uh, the massive increase in, of. Uh, crew members lost 
in the abyss in Anoinkus that we can clone jump back, but anyone on a cruise ship, uh, crewing a ship that is lost in, uh, in, in the abyss, there's no way for us to recover them. Uh, why does that not play a role in the mechanics? Okay, so... This, this kind of also goes into blueprints and all that kind of stuff. The thing that you need to understand is that there is no standard in how to construct these various things, right? Like there's, there's not a 100% standard of what is a Mega Pulse Laser 2. Okay. Uh, however, there are various different standards and thresholds, minimums, that are required for it to be considered that. And so our systems, given the fact that they are working with an abstraction of, of the sis situation and not the reality of the situation. Peyton, thank you for joining us. Uh, you don't actually use your weapon system, your stuff necessarily at full capacity, unless you're overheating it or whatever. Um, you are Kronarg, Kronarong. Thank you for joining us down the rabbit hole, Jeevan Online. They went for consistency over maximum, right? So now multiple people can manufacture these weapon systems. And as long as they can hit a certain threshold, then, or, you know, hold up to a certain standard, then they count as that. Um, likewise, your crew is kind of invisible because they just do their job. The insurance pays for them, etc. All these concepts are abstracted to us uh, within the systems. That doesn't mean that they're not happening. That doesn't mean that every, you know, our guns are all manufactured exactly the same to the exact same standards. Uh, quite the contrary. But they have been, they're within a, a good enough tolerance that they can be used in that role and therefore that's what they are to us. And we use them specifically at a, you know, the standardized method of use such that we have an expected outcome. Now, you could talk about like how um, the the random nature of of damage, the damage that you do, and such like that, are maybe related to that or whatever. But but if you break it down deep down inside, that's why like blueprint copies uh, are are a thing, and why Tech Two, more importantly, um, is uh, like needs to be researched is that the blueprints, like, is all of the stuff. It's not just, like, a set of instructions. It's not literally a blueprint. It's, like, a bunch of the pieces that it takes to create this thing. And it's, like, it figures it out for this specific one. And then you have the exact methodology for that one. And then it produces that. And then you have to, you know, you, you have to do it again. Now, it, it, it's going to produce something of exactly the same tolerance, but it's not going to get there through the same method necessarily I do like that being said I I do love the idea of ship crews being introduced as a mechanic I'm just explaining why it's I guess okay that it's not I'll put it that way I think it would be really cool if we could get to know our crew there's some chronicles that that talk about the interactions between capsuleers and their crew uh, they don't usually end up well for the crew, but, you know, they happen. Hey, Chapster, thanks for dropping by. Have a good night. Boarding parties. Well, I mean, that's the whole... So, interestingly enough, uh, that's the whole thing that created Aegis. You know, the organization that is the core of Edencom, Aegis, um, is a special division of Concord that was created because there was raiding parties in the southern ship lanes near Molten Heath that were boarding ships. And so they created uh, a, a group that was trained in, you know, being boarding parties or other, uh, uh, in other ways, foot soldiers. And that is what Aegis is. So, um... Yeah, 
Alright. There's a lot going on when it comes to boarding parties, I guess is my point. Hold on. This is this is interesting. So what is this spatial phenomena? Let's see what this says. A natural phenomena that rumor says will hurdle those who come too close to faraway places. See, this is this is these things that existence to me. So the signs are that these groups are no longer here at all, but they have ruins everywhere. But their society is a hundred percent eradicated, right? So um Either way. And now we now we build uh, things. I also think it's interesting that, like, supposedly this gate is right next to this spatial phenomena, given the fact that the spatial phenomena probably is a flaw in topological space, um, which probably is why that gate is right there, is because it, like... You know, using the, the same resonance that creates that that pinpoint error um, also allows the gate to form the wormhole. Docking permission requested. Uh, Concord does board things and put things in the bot titans to bring them to high sec. No, they just take it over. They, they disconnect you, uh, the pod, from the ship, hijack it, they hijack the controls, and teleport it out. The the capsuleer is either already dead or already imprisoned by that point. Uh, I'll need to check what's said in local, all right? Uh, I mean, it's very, maybe, maybe they did, did say something. I guess that's to my understanding. But it makes the most sense to me because Concord, uh, like, so Concord used to be vulnerable to us. Um, but then when the Zombie Co. stuff happened, um, they, quote unquote got augmented by the Jovians with advanced technology, which at that point made them invincible to our weapons and ability to shut off our ships remotely. Given the fact that the Jovians were the inventors of the pod, it's safe to assume that Concord has control over our uh potentially has control over our the connection point between our pods and the uh ship. What is local chat and lore? Uh, it is the fluid router. Welcome Alpha Pan to the rabbit hole. Yeah, uh, the, it is the civilian channel of the fluid router. That's why... So when uh, the Triglavians were attacking uh, the structures, the infrastructure, in, during the early invasions, uh, they were going after the caches of quantumly entangled uh, helium isotope 4, which is the uh, stuff used in fluid routers. And uh, they, so the, the sudden destruction of, of major caches of that limited uh, the you know, supply, which caused the SEC to have concern over the ability to maintain the fluid routers with, with current supply, and so authorized the shutting off of the civilian channels, um, or at least the going into low-powered mode of the civilian channels within null security space in that period of time in order to prioritize the military channels of the fluid router, which, was, which would like be how we do cloning and stuff like that. So, and yes, that is that is the legitimate stated lore explanation of the blackout. You can go look at the lore events from that time. In fact, there's scope articles here. I if you if you if you insist, 
Hold on. Uh, I yell at my, my own straw man. Let's watch the, the uh, scope articles about it and see what they have to say from that time. See if it, they, that elucidates anything. That's the right word. I want it to be the right word. We're going to go with that's the right word. All right, hold on. Do, do, do. By the way, I, I have gone back and like looked at my VODs from like last week, and honestly, I don't know if they're even worth posting on YouTube. I may just post them as private and then like, or not po uh, private, but uh, unlisted, and then like put it up on my Patreon or something, so that way people can share it on the link if they want to. Uh, anywho. What about Wormhole local, local? So, again, there is no... Um, there is no organized fluid router within wormhole space. Uh, the fluid router uses the gate network in order to, uh, as almost like modems or routers rather, uh, routers within the fluid router. Uh, however, the interface within our ship, within our pod, still can communicate its final burst. So we can clone, but there isn't the same level of services out there, as if that makes sense. All right, chicken, have a good one. Oh seven. After a noticeable reduction of drifter attacks on null sec structures earlier this week, it appears that another wave of attacks is forming. Adding to the confusion, Concord's SCC division has announced that New Eden's Fluid Router FTL communications network is under enormous pressure due to the combined impact of the Triglavian and Drifter invasions. Resupply of the vital quantum entangled 4 helium superfluid used in the network is increasingly under threat. Do you think I'm making this to shit up? To ensure sustainable operation of the FTL comms network and guard against the risk of strategic communications being compromised, the SCC will be enforcing reduced bandwidth across its NullSec routers. With drifter strikes continuing for over a week, this assault represents the first major offensive by the Drifters since their attack on the Amar Empire four years ago. Hitting dozens of systems during the first wave of attacks, the Drifters roamed between jump gates, asteroid belts, and structures, attacking anyone and anything they encountered. Their fleets were often striking multiple targets simultaneously in each system. After a brief pause in the assault, the Drifters seem now to be initiating another wave of attacks. Not only are they attacking structures, but they also seem to show more focus towards hunting down and destroying individual pilots. It should be noted that Drifters, if given the opportunity, will always mercilessly pod capsuleers. Taking both Concord and Capsuleers completely by surprise, the attacks have created considerable concern and confusion among the NullSec power blocks. Once the predicted local communications blackout is imposed, Capsuleer warlords will have to deal with the developing situation without intelligence gathered from automated registration on local solar system channels. The SCC has additionally stated, that if the scale of the attacks continues, then their fluid routers are not expected to support full services in NullSec beyond another week or so. In light of this, it seems clear that the NullSec blackout will take place very soon. This is Lena Amber, reporting for The Scope. So if anybody ever suggests to you that the blackout happened without warning, that's not true. Uh, I it is also getting late, so I'm going to do the la the second video, and then we're probably going to sign off. So. Bandwidth and usage limitations on faster-than-light communications in NullSec were lifted by the SCC earlier this week. This marks the end of the two months blackout, which was primarily caused by drifter attacks on FTL infrastructure and quantum-entangled four helium supplies across NullSec. While communications have now been fully restored, 
Concord officials warn that communication service levels remain subject to change, possibly at short notice. The Triglavians have expanded <laughs> their again. invasion into low sec regions as Kanid, Aridia, and Moldenheath have come under attack in the last week. Reports from the fronts are mixed, but defenses seem to be holding. Low sec systems in Genesis and the Forge have also been hit by new attacks as the Triglavians continue their pattern of shifting attacks around New Eden. These new fronts are in addition to continuing incursions into high security space by Triglavian world arcs and widespread scouting forces. The scope has acquired new footage from a previously unknown abyssal dead space pocket. The imaging data appears to show an array of construction yards with a high level. Pause for thoughts and prayers for the poor Vexor pilot that was sent into the T5 abyss to find the construction yard. Level of activity. There are no completed ships visible in the footage, but comparisons with the Vexor, which entered the pocket and provided the footage, suggest the Triglavian ships being constructed can be rated as capital ships. The structural components that have been laid down so far also appear to correspond to schematics from intercepted Triglavian messages. The intention behind this new shipbuilding activity remains unknown, but analysts believe the Triglavians are responding to the course of the war so far and preparing to change their tactics. In other news, extensive renovations and a major expansion project have started on the Jita 44 Kaldari Navy Assembly Plant. Remember when Jita looked like that? <laughs> for all aspects of the project were recently awarded to the PKN Interstellar Consortium, led by the CBD, Lidai, and NOH Megacore. Shady all By of them. far the busiest trade hub in New Eden, the expansion of the station has long been considered overdue. The amount of daily traffic and storage requirements have caused overstretch for years and much activity unrelated to trading or the naval facilities has progressively been relocated to other stations in Jita. The project's phased program of expansion is expected to take at least 12 months. This is Alton Havery reporting for The Scope. I forgot that this is the one with the freaky Alton Havery at the end. Okay, whoo, there we go. So, I don't even remember why we put that, oh, that, yeah. So that's, see, I know what I'm talking about. This lore stuff is there. It was always there. Uh, our sorrow operatives have placed experimental conduit filament activators aboard the criminal vessels, and these will be used to bring the guilty to, uh, of severe uh, and clear breaches of Omega. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but that explains how they got them there, not how they took them over. So they used Concord technology to, like, basically shut off the pod, which is hard to do for the record. And they, I think are not allowed to do it very frequently. Uh, the Concord is kind of a little bit unchecked now that the Jove directorate aren't around. Uh, and that is its own problem, but that's a whole separate issue that I don't have time for. So let's find somebody to raid.